Thank you for joining us. I know there's an awful lot to squeeze into these uh, Milken days, a lot to take in. Uh, I'm going to give you a warning that I'm going to be asking for engagement from you all as well. I'm not going to leave the questions to the very end. Partway through, I'm going to ask for your burning thoughts, contributions, comments on the state of the US economy and politics post the midterms. Um, I am also, I think I should remind you that there is a mobile app for the Institute. So if you haven't got that yet, that's a very handy thing to have. And if you feel the need to comment uh, on social media, in fact, please do. As we talk, uh, the hashtag is MI Global. Um, we have quite a range of political and economic insight for you here today. Um, I should say, my name's Philippa Thomas. Uh, I am a BBC journalist. I do cover uh, US and UK politics. It's just frantic right now. But luckily for you, the insight today is coming from my panel here. You probably know who's on stage. But just to remind you briefly, next to me, Douglas holtz Eakin, president of the American Action Forum. And among his many senior academic and policy posts, uh, he sat on the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission, was director of domestic and economic policy for the John McCain presidential campaign. Before that, you were the sixth director of the nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office. Adrian Elrod uh, joins us as president of the communications firm Elrod Strategies. Uh, Adrienne has more than a decade of experience uh, working on Capitol Hill, most recently served as Hillary for America's director of strategic communications. Steve Kruskos, you may remember if you were here last year, was part of our lively panel then. Steve is Global Vice Chair at Transaction Advisory Services, EY. And on appointment to his current role in 2016, uh, Steve uh, became a member of EY's Global Executive and so is leading more than 17,000 people across the world. And the kind of transactions he's dealing with are pretty significant, running into the uh, multi-billion dollars. Sarah Latham uh, is Chief Advisor and Managing Partner of Freud's, uh, most recently a Senior Advisor in the Hillary for America Network. Sarah is a communications expert who has long advised both US and UK politicians. You perhaps can give us some insider, outsider perspective on what's happening uh, over the water. And Frank Luntz, uh, many of you will know, founder and president of Luntz Global, one of the expert communications professionals in America today and for decades. His focus group sessions are legendary, but he's not only an advisor to media and to politicians, but also to um, top corporations, chief executives across many sectors. So we have a lot to say. We're going to talk about the state of the US economy and the state of US politics, of course, absolutely intertwined. But I'm going to start with, with an economic question to ask each of you uh, for a brief insight into what you think about the state of the US economy right now or what matters about the economy to US voters right now. And Douglas, I'm going to begin with you. Well, sure. Um, well, thank you for the chance to be here. Um, uh, right now, meaning 2018, 2019, the U.S. economy is in quite good shape, very strong. I anticipate uh, continued growth in the 25 to 3% range and, and low inflation. Past 2019, uh, some downside risks uh, quickly materialized uh, in uh, trade policy, in the housing sector, uh, in um, certainly the, the normalization of monetary policy. So we have some, some issues there. And then past that, uh, long term, uh, there, there are two big issues, one of which is the federal uh, budget outlook, um, charitably horrible, maybe worse, uh, and then uh, the productivity growth in the United States. But for the moment, not bad. Okay. Good overview. Thank you. Adrienne. Sure. So I'll focus a little bit more on, I think, how the American people are feeling in the U.S. economy right now. And you, we saw this reflected in the midterms, that this economic growth, the stock market doing as well as it's doing, um, the unemployment rate being low, not every American is feeling that. And that's been an issue that has been driving American politics for the past few years. It's frankly one of the reasons why Donald Trump was elected president, and it's one of the reasons why Democrats did so well in the midterm elections. Um, you know, the average American out there is not seeing their wages, or I'm sorry, their wages being raised. Um, and that is something that Hillary Clinton focused on a lot during the campaign, but Donald Trump really spoke to a lot of voters, and that's why he, and one, again, one of the reasons why he was elected. So. What I think is going to be interesting moving forward is seeing, you know, do Democrats and Republicans work together to pass some sort of wage growth measure, whether it's the $15 minimum wage um, increase or, you know, whether it's some sort of middle class tax cut, because I think that President Trump will have a very difficult time getting reelected if Congress and the Trump administration does not do something about this. Steve. 
Okay, so I am also pretty optimistic uh, about the U.S. economy, certainly for 18 and 19, uh, as Doug stated. I'm, I might be a little bit more optimistic even going into 20. I know that's looking out a bit farther, but you know, I have to sort of plan with that kind of horizon in my business. Um, you know, I think there's probably more runway uh, of growth from tax reform. I think we're seeing a lot of upside from deregulation um, that the Trump administration has pushed. Um, yes, I certainly do see some of the risks uh, that Doug mentioned as well and agree with Adrian that inclusivity of growth is an issue um, in the U.S. And I'm not a politician or a political analyst, but have to imagine that's going to come into play um, in this next election cycle. Um, I'll speak to the politics of this also. I think when you look at the exit polls from the recent midterms, despite the fact that the economy is flourishing and voters were generally happy with the direction of the country and the economy, when you look at the exit poll results, um, the economy seemed to fall probably third or fourth in line in terms of other issues like healthcare and immigration and gun control that were more pressing to voters. So when you look at an outlook of, of potential downturn in the economy, that doesn't loom well for a president whose approval rating is already below 50%. And in terms of language and communication, if I can bridge the Republican-Democratic gap, one of the challenges is that people don't communicate the economy effectively at all. So we talk about a growth rate of 3% to the average person in Britain or America, they don't know what growth rate means. They understand a healthy economy, healthy job market, but growth rate to them sounds like it's Oxford or Cambridge language. Second is that they talk about capitalism. To the average person now, capitalism is all about profit. It's about Wall Street, when what they care most about is Main Street. And third is, we already heard the phrase middle class. Right now, only, actually, it's just under a third who identify themselves as middle class when virtually everybody calls himself a hardworking taxpayer. And by the way, if I have to stare at that monitor of me, all it says is, <laughs> I mean, seriously, you guys in the back, I have to look at this? <laughs> Thank you. Good. Now I'm only one-sixth as fat as I was moments ago. We don't humanize it, and I'm going to give you a specific example, and they brought me back on again. If you want to talk about tax policy rather than middle-class tax cut, when you wake up in the morning and drink your first cup of coffee, you pay a sales tax. You go out to your garage, which is what you say here, you pay an automobile tax. You drive to work, you pay a gas tax. At work, you pay an income tax. You turn on the light, you pay an electricity tax. Flush the toilet, you pay a water tax. I flew here from New York City, I paid an airport tax. I'm staying overnight at this hotel. I'm not, but the Milken Institute is paying a hotel tax. <laughs> you shut off your cell phone just before you walked in here, you pay a cell phone tax, you turn it back on, get home, you pay a property tax. Even when you die, you pay a death tax. We are taxed from the moment we wake up in the morning to the moment we go to sleep at night. We're taxed from our cradle to our grave and hardworking, because it's not middle class, it's hardworking taxpayers deserve a break. If we humanize, you're the smartest guy I know on economics, and I don't understand about 28% of what you say. We have to. This is a good start. 28%. And by the way, 28% of all facts are made up on the spot. Facts. So we, so we have to humanize, personalize, and individualize our discussion of the economy. Otherwise, the average person won't get it. I just want to throw it actually right at this point as well. I'm an economist. I have yeah. no soul, and now I have to humanize this? <laughs> you have to humanize, and I'm going to throw it on top of what Frank's just said. I spent a lot of the last week on BBC World News talking about the Climate Change Summit in Poland, in Katowice, and that, that's more taxes to come, if anything mm -hmm. comes in terms of political action. So, yeah, we are going to have to talk about taxes. Yeah, no question. Um, I, I think... In the U.S., this is going to be a, an enormous um, debate over the next five to ten years. The reality is that the federal government is the, the most systemically important and dysfunctional financial institution in the United States. And the long-term budget outlook is just a, an increasing divergence between revenues and spending. Uh, my friends on the right believe that you can solve this problem with faster growth. Uh, my friends on the left believe that you can solve it with higher taxes. They're both wrong. We're going to need every bit of growth we can get. We're going to have to control the spending, and we're probably going to have to get more revenue. It's going to be a really, really interesting discussion with 28% of the facts wrong. Well, Actually, what about, what about it? It's more like 50%. <laughs> but what, what about infrastructure? I mean, that's one lever that really hasn't been applied yet in the U.S. to the degree it has been in certain countries around the world. Take Australia, for example. Sure. 
I mean, do you see upside in infrastructure? Um, th there's an economic upside to the infrastructure. We've run into two things in the U.S. Uh, number one, if you took the Australian model, they do an enormous amount of re asset recycling yes. where they privatize public entities, use the funds to do the infrastructure. We've never gotten that model going in the U.S. for whatever reason. Um, and then in terms of just pure federal financing, there's no money. And so uh, they've got to get serious about uh, making room in the budget for infrastructure and basic annual appropriations. I mean, the U.S. has a really interesting budget problem. In addition to the divergence, most of the money is, is pre-committed to large pension and health programs, and the annual decisions are now a minimum of what's in the budget. That's exactly the opposite of the way our founders saw it, and so we need room for national security, basic research, infrastructure, education, things like that. But if we're going to talk also about, about what taxes are for and, and what is uh, discretionary right. and that kind of priming of the pump and infrastructure projects in language that voters can understand, that's more of a problem for Democrats, isn't it? Adrian, Sarah? Well, I mean, I guess it's sort of a, I don't know if it's necessarily a problem for Democrats. I think it's a party, or a problem to Frank's point that both parties have is trying to communicate this. But I think the average voter, the average American, the average person can certainly understand what it means to you know, rebuild road, roads and, and bridges and, and invest in infrastructure because our infrastructure is crumbling around us in the United States. I think that is one area where you actually will see Democrats and Republicans work together to pass something because it's a win-win for both, you know, for both sides. It helps uh, get people employed. It helps, um, you know, it, it rebuild communities. Um, and it also provides you know, a deliverable for people to take, take home when they're, they're, they're running there's for no Congress. no accountability. I mean, the issue for both parties, and here it's awful. I took a train up to Cambridge. I don't know who's British here. The first three trains on Sunday were canceled. You tried traveling on Sunday? Yeah, traveling on Sunday was your first mistake. I, <laughs> <laughs> I did not know that because the government is so focused on Brexit, we cannot travel on Sundays. <laughs> no one put that note in my hotel room. <laughs> or after midnight. And it wasn't just the trains. In driving around London in the last three days, every road is un under construction. Uh, there, there were issues. By the way, it's not just the trains. They said they didn't even have enough personnel to monitor the trains. That was the excuse. Another one that I saw was the reason why... We are why somewhat the, distracted right now. The it's reason why happened. the train was late, it's because it was delayed. That's the actual description <laughs> on it. <laughs> okay, I this know, is diversionary <laughs> tactics. Let's get back to the state of the US economy. <laughs> I know you have a dry sense of humor, but that's not funny to me. <laughs> you, you haven't seen leaves on the line yet. So we have to, both parties every and every ideology, there has to be a sense of accountability of personal responsibility and results. Accountability to deliver on budget and on time. Personal responsibility so companies that do not do it, such as British Rail, so the senior people are punished. And I know that your, your senior guy in rail was fired in the last 40 hours. And then a sense of results so that you can actually feel the quality of life difference. My fear is that we end up talking about infrastructure but when we actually go to do it, we don't deliver, and all that does is add to the cynicism of the public yeah. Yeah. on both well, sides. Well, that's why it's important to study where it has worked and how it's worked without accountability, Australia being an example, yeah. which, by the way, is 28 years without a recession. And part of the, pro the problem, the obviously part of the problem, is, is a lack of trust in institutions and one set of facts being put up against another set of facts. And we, we never argued over facts before. Kellyanne Conway is a friend of mine. The only, the, my issue was when she said that, well, there's your set of facts. I understand evidence-based, but there's evidence for the prosecution and evidence for the defense. If we debase our culture so much that there is no such thing as a fact, that you and I, because we're on different sides politically, that we actually can't agree on the facts, that we are in serious trouble as a free society. We will disagree on solutions. We will disagree even on the problems, but on the facts themselves, there has to be some common language or we are in deep trouble. Is there a chance in January for a reset as the House of Representatives is taken over, controlled by the Democrats? And we could either be getting into talk of impeachment, all my headlines could be accusations and impeachment, or we could be into talk of policy and programs. I'm looking at Sarah now because I'm thinking about <laughs> yes. all these uh, communication <laughs> strategies, but what they stand for in terms of the substance 
of government and governing together. Well, I'm optimistic. I mean, Adrian and I both were in the Clinton White House and lived through impeachment and know firsthand how destabilizing that process is and how distracting, distracting it is from you know, the job that you were elected to do. So my hope is that that's not an, a route that the Democrats pursue. But then beca precisely because they know how destabilizing it is, well, well the uh, there's not a lot, yeah, I'm not a politician, but you know, there's not a lot to be gained just by attacking the other side, as yeah. opposed to using two years to build a constructive case for change. And I think, I always use this phrase, walk and chew gum at the same time. Um, and when I do a, lot of, do a lot of Fox News, and I usually get eviscerated by <laughs> my fellow panelists when I say it, but it's true. Um, you know, we do have, a, Congress has a very important oversight function. Um, we will, as Democrats, the Democratic Party, Elijah Cummings, Adam Schiff, um, and Jerry Nadler, who will be the chairman of the respective oversight committees, um, will make sure the Trump administration is held accountable. But at the same time, Leader Pelosi, and she knows, by the way, that the only way she's going to be elected speaker is if she does have a forward-thinking agenda, um, which is focused on infrastructure, which is focused on lowering health care costs. That's the only way that she's going to be elected speaker and the only way that she's going to stay in that position. Um, so she's going to be focusing on that tack. But again, to Sarah's point, look, the votes are not there for impeachment, right? They're just not. I mean, we could impeach them in the House. We're not going to impeach them in the Senate. Um, it's a fruitless endeavor as far as I'm concerned for Democrats to take on. There will be a part of our, a wing of our party who expects it. So I think you've got to sort of show that, you know, there's got to be a little song and dance there. But at the same time, it's not what the, American, the majority of American people want, and it's certainly not what those independent uh, swing voters there in the middle um, are looking for the Democrats to do. They actually want to see government function again. And I think if Democrats can show that they can do that, we'll be in a winning position. So mechanically, the Trump administration has no legislative agenda, really. So th there's nothing that was at stake in the mid-sessions about getting something done in Congress, because the same things that we're not going to get done with Republicans will not get done with Democrats. Oh, they, will, they will do the very minimum to fund the government, not much more over the next two years. It's my guess. They probably yeah. won't do infrastructure. They'll talk about it. Talk about we'll it. see. Yeah. That means that he will continue to do the bulk of his policy initiatives through executive actions, as he's yeah. done on trade. We can talk about that. As he's done on immigration, I don't want to talk about that. <laughs> um, and, and then you get the following very serious dynamic, which is the oversight function, which is real, can get tied up into oversight of his executive actions, which is fundamentally political, and then the wild card becomes the president himself. And if he follows form, what he will have found in the Democratic Congress in the House uh, is the greatest favor he could get politically, someone to blame for everything. And that's what the next two years will be, him blaming the Democrats, interfering his attempt to do the right thing for Americans. I mean, just with my yeah. cynical journalist hat on, I looked at Donald Trump's latest tweets about um, those who might give evidence against him and those who might not fold uh, very provocative tweets and thought, I think he's baiting the Democrats because he would like nothing better than an attempt to bring articles of impeachment because then he's the victim. He's the guy who's trying to run the country yeah, whilst impeachment country? proceedings are underway. What yeah. about the country? He doesn't care. I was there on election night and I got to watch the yeah. uh, results with him. And it's good that the results were better on the election night because he was in a better mood. It got worse over time. <laughs> and I asked him, what does the J in Donald J. Trump stand for? You know what he told me? Genius. <laughs> okay. You made that up. Every. I have to be careful because you don't know that I actually work for E and Y. <laughs> so whatever you say is absolutely brilliant. It's been wrong the whole time here, but he, you are brilliant. My issue is that we joke up here and we are collegial up here, when the rest of the country, both our countries, both the UK and America. We are mean, we are brutal, we are disrespectful, we lack any sense of civility. Not only do we reject our opponents' arguments, but we accuse them of either being stupid or evil. And so the politics that we practice, both in the House of Parliament and in the US Congress, is actually destroying, and I don't mean it's hurting, I mean destroying, through the focus groups I do, it is just destroying the fabric that unites us. And my issue is, it may be a tradition to be the opposition party and try to take somebody down and try to bait them. If we do it now with a country in this great economy mm -hmm. that is already so polarized, what happens when it starts to actually deteriorate? It's so bad now, what happens if it gets worse? Yeah. 
at this point, actually, I'd like to invite any uh, comments or brief, brief comments or questions, if you have them. You might not have expected me to say that so early. But just if anybody has anything they want to enter into the debate at this point, raise a hand. And if not, I'll ask you to think, and I'll come back to you in about 10 minutes, because I certainly have more. I think you're all, oh, I do, do see a hand, a couple of hands there. We're just going to take, uh, if you'd tell us your name, please, uh, and brief question or comment. perspective, who do you expect to be the nominee in 2020? Oh, I mean, boy. Gonna be a bunch of <laughs> we'll come back to that for sure. <laughs> and I just see a hand. Yes, great. Again, just tell us your name, please. Uh, Ian Shoris, I would like to ask, you say the economy is probably good. I posit a counterfactual that we're already sort of beginning of a recession. How does he handle this, as, as you said? How does that get played out? How does Trump handle this? Yep, and there we go. A uh, Couple more hands I see in the middle. Hi. Hello, do you think we're living through the decline of the West and the future is in Southeast Asia and um, Sub-Saharan Africa? Big thoughts. Okay, decline of the West, how long have we got? Right, hello sir. Hi, I'm Jeff Trinkline with Gibson Dunn. I'm a tax lawyer. And I have paid a lot of attention to the tax legislation in the first two years of the Trump presidency. Uh, the tax legislation that we actually got was put together so quickly that there are huge gaping holes in helping us as lawyers, helping the government as the administrator to figure out how this is actually going to work. Is there a climate for Democrats and Republicans to reach across the aisle and say, yeah, I know this was your tax legislation, Republicans but we Democrats have a responsibility along with you to fix the gaps that are there and, and make the changes necessary to, to have it work for the public. Thank you. I'll come back to you all in, a, in um, 10 minutes or so, but we've got... Those are all too hard. Let's get some, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let's get some easier questions. Um, I'm not going to ask you all to answer all. I'm going to just ask you each to kind of uh, pick, a, pick a topic, and we've heard about you know, who do we think could be the nominee for Democrats, how Donald Trump might handle a, a US in recession, broader question about the decline of the West and the rise of Southeast Asia, and the climate to reach across the aisle on tax, what, what might be achieved uh, together. So uh, who looks most eager at that point now, Adrienne? The 2020? Or the Whichever last you like, whichever you like. I'll take 2020. Um, look, I think you're going to see as many as 30 to 35 um, potential candidates file in the first quarter of um, 2019. I think the big question is who is actually in the race in August of 2019. Um, you may see a lot of people file and they realize this is, I'm, I don't have a pathway here and I'm, not, I'm, I'm dropping out. Um, but they'll also say in their obituary, like I was once a presidential candidate. So um, <laughs> I look at this into two tiers. I think you're going to see the first tier, um, which is the top tier candidates. And I think in that tier, you will see a mix of the following people, Joe Biden, Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, Kamala Harris, and Cory Booker slash Kirsten Gillibrand. Um, I think everybody else will sort of be in the second tier. And I think in the second tier, which includes people like Terry McAuliffe, the former governor of Virginia, um, Mitch Landrieu, the former mayor of New Orleans, um, Steve Bullock, the current, um, or is he the outgoing uh, governor of Montana? Current. Still the, current. Okay, current mm -hmm. governor of Montana. I think you'll pe see people like that, and I think somebody in that tier will emerge to a top tier. Um, but I think it's going to be a very interesting time to be a Democratic strategist. <laughs> and, and a, a Democratic time operative. For voters. And an interesting time for the voters. Um, I'm frankly looking forward to actually seeing a real policy debate, which I think will emerge from a Democratic primary, as opposed to sort of this, you know, Twitter war back and forth, small hands, you know, comments that uh, Trump sort of instigated and in, in the, the way that he steered that Republican primary. I think you're actually going to see a far more intellect, intellectually driven um, primary about the, the state of our country and the vision for moving our country forward, which is going to be um, a lot of fun to watch. I would just add a few names to that list, Hickenlooper and Garcetti, mm -hmm. and the entire category of billionaires, um, one of whom I think has maybe already flamed, flamed out, but we still have Mike Bloomberg and uh, Howard Schultz. Yes. And just to add to this, I was, I was in um, 
Missouri and DC covering the midterms. And it, it just struck me, of course, in congressional elections, you can have candidates who run progressive, liberal, socialists, and you can have candidates who run centrist and cautious, mm -hmm. and they can all win because they know who they're pitching to. Mm -hmm. Not the same when you're looking for a presidential candidate. I mean, this, you say it'll be lively, it'll be interesting, it'll be productive. It could also be a bloodbath. Yeah, I, look, I think inevitably it's going to be a bloodbath, but I don't think it's going to be the type of bloodbath that you saw in there the Republican primary. There are good bloodbaths and bad bloodbaths, right? Right. I mean, I, it's, you know, I, I don't see any Democratic candidate for president getting on sta a debate stage and calling somebody, you know, small hands or, you know, getting into like a name-calling uh, routine, which I don't think is what the Republican primary candidates wanted. Donald Trump just steered it in that direction. I don't think you're going to see that on, on the Democratic side. But it's going to be interesting because it is one thing to have a policy debate on um, particular issues, but I also think that we learned this last election that the American population, this is more in Frank's corner, don't necessarily want to hear a policy debate. I mean, they look at candidates based on their personality um, and um, a litany of other factors, but Hillary Clinton's you know, policy rollouts that we constantly did on the campaign didn't always uh, Land move well. the needle <laughs> in, in the way that we wanted it to go. Well, actually, Frank, if, if picking up from what you said, you know, just before I asked for questions about the decline in the nature of, of political debate and education, is it that voters don't want to hear about policy or that the narrative isn't, isn't being pitched the right way? It's both, but it's also the education system. And to leave the jokes aside for one moment, when they polled moms in America and in China, and they asked them, what do you want most? Who here's got children? Raise your hands. Moms or dads, children. Actually, a smaller percentage than they would have expected. You see, you people are too busy making money, and you're not making children. <laughs> also, there was some pause there. Anyway. <laughs> the problem is that moms want their kids to be happy. It's the number one priority for American moms. In China, the number one priority for moms is to have their kids well-educated. So in America, their kids are happy and dumb. In China, their kids are educated and unhappy. I teach, and this is not meant for a laugh, I teach at NYU Abu Dhabi. These are kids from all across the globe. There are more than 100 countries there. This is the best educational system, the truly most international education system on the face of the globe. And I know that my Chinese students are brilliant. And they are working morning, noon, and night. They are trying to understand. They're trying to learn. They're trying to put it all together. And my American students are far less dedicated on their studies and far more dedicated on having a good time. I will tell you, even with the challenges of English, the Chinese students that I met, and I met them from all across the spectrum, they are so well prepared for the challenges of the 21st century. And the American kids would have a problem with this panel trying to keep up. And it, it infuriates me because if that education gap is not addressed, I don't care about trade because in the end you can make it work out, even foreign relations and diplomacy. If our kids, and I now say this just for Americans, if our kids aren't better educated right now, America is going to lose. And I don't think we're going to be able to improve it. I don't think there will be enough focus on education to do it. And that's why I'm so pessimistic. These kids don't know anything. Who's Steve, a millennial here? Steve, you any? spend a lot of time going back. If and you're a millennial well, here, you? get out. <laughs> <laughs> you should be reading. You should not be sitting here right now. Go to work. They're here. Everybody's Learning getting you. educated, getting engaged. <laughs> Steve, we, we were saying earlier, you go back and forth. You spend a lot of time in China. <coughs> and yeah. just, I know we, we are going to be talking trade, but in, that, in terms of the different cultural approaches. Yeah, I don't know. Look, I am. I had the pleasure of attending a presentation Frank did in Singapore um, on this topic, and that was a pretty daunting statistic um, that he put up. And, and, you know, we do a lot of work with the education sector, and yeah, it does concern me. I mean, the U.S. is not as focused on education as China and many other so our Eastern countries, which goes back to the East-West yeah, question. The, the decline of the West and the potential rise of Southeast Asia. I mean, this is yeah, exactly yeah. what you were talking yeah, about. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I mean, I the whole month of September um, in Asia, across China, Singapore, Japan. Um, it's a fast-growing part of our business. I mean, it, you know, is the base of power going to shift? I don't know. We can take guesses, but it's going to become much more significant. But when you look at recruiting American workers, American professionals in the next 10, 20 years? Oh, well, I mean, recruiting 
professionals to, to do what we do in the finance profession, corporate finance, it is hard everywhere. Um, but if you look at the talent coming out you know, of China, for example, it is pretty, it, it's pretty daunting. I, I, think, I think this remains the, the greatest policy challenge in the United States and the one that we've been least successful at. The, the U.S. K-12 education system is failing Americans, and, and that's, that's been a reality. It's well measured, it's well documented, but no one addresses it. Uh, I've been worried about this for, for quite some time. You also and, and it is productivity. Reflected. I mean, it's, it's, oh, all, it's, it's everything. all, it's everything. Yeah, it pulls together. Uh, so, and, and I, you know, Frank may have the best explanation for it, but, you know, as a policy director in 2007, 2008, that was a policy-rich campaign. 2012, not so much. 2016, zero. It, the trend bothers me tremendously. There's no real discussion of the issues. And can I take U.S. recession for 20? Absolutely. Thank you. Um, <laughs> uh, you can't have a recession in the United States without having the household sector go south. It's, it's two-thirds of the economy, and it's in very, very good shape. So the, the high-profile negative events, stock market um, in particular, I, I think mislead people about the, the quality of the, of the economy. Uh, we have seen, for example, uh, both wage and non-wage compensation, the, p the pace of growth double over the past two years. It's now at 3%, um, a little bit above. Um, so real uh, wages are rising. The household sector is in very good shape. Most of the equity market corrections are really just the Fed normalizing, and there's been too much easy money for a long time, and those asset prices got inflated. That's a good thing for the durability of, of, of the economy. So I don't think we, we face a near-term recession risk. I think that's misplaced. What would uh, uh, Trump do and how would he handle it? Probably not much, to be honest. Uh, there isn't a lot of fiscal space. There is no particular reason to believe that the Congress and the administration will be agile in their uh, response to, to negative news. And as a result, the Federal Reserve will carry the bulk of the responsibility for dealing with any downdraft in the U.S. economy. And for me, that's fine. They are the best position to do it, and they proved in the recession uh, and, and the financial crisis they are very effective in doing that. They may not be able to make the economy grow, but they can stop it from falling very effectively. So I think that we're well positioned from that point of view. And I, I agree with 100% um, with Doug. I, I, you know, the strength of household balance sheets in the U.S. is, under, is underestimated. And, and people will pull out data points on, on different you know, pieces or types of debt, et cetera. But the overall household balance sheet is good. Um, you know, w will we see a slowdown at some point? Sure. But recession, as defined, I, I'm not or seeing anything see. soon. The tone is different. Steve, you and I sat on the panel here last year. I don't know if any of you were, were at this Milken Summit, but um, I asked for, in a journalistic fashion, marks out of 10 for Trump's handling of the economy so far. And it was, I think there were eights and nines across the board uh, because partly the tax bill had just passed. I mean, I think mm -hmm. three days before, everybody was talking tax cuts, everybody was talking deregulation. So that's the hands-off uh, part of the business done, you know, as far as the White House was concerned. But it does strike me that what we're talking about now is, is, is what comes beyond that and is there a plan? Well, I, so, well it's hard. It, it's hard. You know, when you have a recession every, whatever it is, 10, 12 years, I mean, it's hard for people not to say, you know, think there is going, a recession is coming. Um, if you look at deregulation, and, and, and this is something that, you know, Doug <coughs> knows probably a heck of a lot more about than, than I do, but, you know, the cost of regulation in the U.S. is, is pretty, pretty significant. I've, I've seen numbers like 15,000 per year per household, something like that. I think you, some numbers, you want some you numbers? Produce those numbers. Here's some great numbers. Okay. I mean, it's... Ready great numbers, no, the more, here's, some, here's some great numbers. So, so I run a think tank that's an over 21 daycare center, and we have an intern program, <laughs> and we bring bright young Americans, not as bright as they should be, uh, <laughs> to Washington, <laughs> and we make them read the Federal Register, which is our diary of every rule and regulation made by the federal government, all agencies. In the eight years of the Obama administration, not to make it personal, but to make it personal, uh, the, uh, they finalized a costly regulation in an average rate of 1.1 per day every day for eight straight years total self-reported cost to the private sector of complying with those regulations, $890 billion. During his time in office, the Trump administration has added to that total exactly zero. They have shut down the regulatory state. It's an unprecedented accomplishment. Whether you like or dislike the particulars of the regulations, I've never seen anything like this, and it has to have mattered for the economy. Yeah, I think it has and mattered. It I think tax uh, reform has mattered. I think that um, you know, the U.S. becoming a net producer of energy has mattered. So, I, you know. Let me 
switch you now then, given that we've talked about what's been taken away, uh, to what is being slapped on, which is um, tariffs, yep. uh, the, the kind of rise in protectionism. Obviously, as we sit here, there's a truce, there's a 90-day pause, which nobody thinks is really enough to sort things out, but is very valuable uh, given uh, the, the, the state of hostilities that, that could have been between the US and China. So I, know this, I don't know whether this comes up as an election issue or not, but it really matters for the future of American jobs. So I won't, we can talk a little bit about the politics or how the, the people feel about it, but on the merits, th this is just a mess. Um, <laughs> you know, I was in- Self-imposed mess, by the way. <laughs> I, agreed, and so I, I was a, in the Bush White House in 2001, 2002, we imposed steel tariffs. Um, they, they harmed consumers of steel more than they helped producers. Um, they invited retaliation, some of which remains in place, and they were declared illegal by the WTO. Other than that, it was a great idea. Um, it's a good job, good and sweet. <laughs> we saw how Trump do exactly the same thing. All the evidence was in, did it anyway, it's a terrible idea. You look at uh, the North American Free Trade Agreement and the renegotiation, the stated claim of the Trump administration is, we Im impose tariffs to get people to the table so we can negotiate better trade deals which have lower tariff and non-tariff barriers to trade. The deal they agreed on has higher tariff and non-tariff barriers to trade. It's a lie. This is a protectionist administration and that's the only way you can look at it. It is damaging economically and the real question is how he's gonna survive it politically because it's not a good idea. A 40% cut on American cars going into China? If, if, if that's so, the Trump tweet saying there's going to be a 40% cut don't, on the tariff on cars. Don't believe anything you heard out of the G20. Everything is the same now as it was before the G20. He creates a crisis to get the appearance of stopping the crisis, but there was no, there was no particular <laughs> progress made on the core issues that divide the United States and China, which are real and which have been real for decades and which have, will not be solved in 90 days. I mean, I just don't buy that. On election day, we did a survey, and one of the questions was, what's the most important issue in this election to you? We had, gave them 16 choices, and trade came in 16th out of 16. Right. However, 2016 or 2018 election? 2018, 2018. Were these however, millennials? However, this is everybody. Millennials cut off after like three minutes because they just didn't have the attention. <laughs> Too many questions. <laughs> and why are you still here? I told you, get a book and start reading. If you had a soybean farmer in Iowa in your focus group, they the, might got a different result. The issue <laughs> is that the public sees China as competing unfairly. They see China as breaking the rules. They see the U.S. under Democratic and Republican administrations as being rolled. They do not blame the GOP. They do not blame the Democrats. They blame everyone. Second is that they, it's not an issue of jobs going to China. The public doesn't understand that innovation and technology every year is removing a million or whatever it is, jobs from the workforce, so they don't understand the politics behind it. But this president is determined that before he leaves office, he will right the relationship that other presidents have not done with China. And I will tell you, I walked into this conference two years ago absolutely on your side. And now having had two trips to China and really studying this issue, he has a point from intellectual property, the way that China treats American companies trying to do business there, how China manipulates its currency. There are legitimate arguments that he is raising and the public is legitimately wait and see let, what happens. But if we let this thing keep on going and we don't say enough is enough, then in the long term, we will lose. So I'm gonna agree and disagree with that and then, we'll, then we can just drop it. But he has a point, he just doesn't have a strategy. There, there is no particular point to picking a fight with Europe if your problem is China. Agreed. And so I don't understand what they're up to. I think that, that this is a really bad strategy that is harming us, some of our allies, and doesn't address the, the fundamental problems with China. He's identified the right culprit. Past that, he hasn't got a good approach. And I just wanna add one more thing on what you were talking about, the soybean farmer in, in Iowa. I mean. That is the issue here, right? Is there, I've seen countless interviews, I've read countless um, long form pieces where reporters have gone out to the very people who would be impacted by these tariffs and have mm -hmm. said, do you blame President Trump for this? They don't. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, and sure. that is why I don't know that this would actually have an electoral impact. Yeah, I had that experience mm. interviewing a, a, no. a farmer in Iowa and the editor of the Des Moines Register about a month ago because mm -hmm. China Daily, I think, had taken out a four-page supplement in the Des Moines Register to put its point of view um, and got called out by President Trump in a tweet. But the, the farmer said, we are really hurting. I don't know how much to plant next year. I don't know what to do. But I've got faith in President Trump in the medium term. So I, I read that same piece, there is, front there page. Is, yeah, yeah. The, and there, there is a, a, a question then about, I suppose, how long faith in President Trump is sustained, and is it sustained up to November 2020? Frank, I'm looking at you. I don't know. I, yes. I, I think, from, from my point of view, as a, as a Republican who has tried to figure out what's going on with this party, this is the biggest question. Uh, I, I have little reason to doubt that there are many who would contest the president in a primary uh, for a variety of reasons, trying to get back the, what they view as the soul of the party, um, move back to traditional conservative values, however you want to frame it. Um, but the fundamental... Uh, obstacle to that is that the voters thus far, his, the base voters, have said things that are basically the soybean farmer. They say, I don't like the tariffs, the tariffs are hurting me, but the president's trying to change things. And they find a way to forgive him. If they ever find themselves unable to forgive him, it is over. And but that hasn't yeah. happened yet. <laughs> Agree. That hasn't happened yet. But I'll give you the percentage. Donald Trump is more popular among Republicans than any president since FDR among their party. This Republican party today is Donald Trump's party. It's why over 90% of the candidates he endorsed in primaries won, even those that one thought had no shot. It is his Republican Party. Now we'll see what happens in 2020. Yeah. But the problem is he only talks to the base. He's right. not expanding into any sort of constituencies. Which and I that I don't think is unsustainable. Yeah. That's not sustainable for 2020. Right. Well, it, it is understandable. If you don't care about the party past your second term, and he doesn't, to mm -hmm. my does that he, do, do any but can he get us? He'll, he'll be challenged. That there'll be a. I think he'll be challenged. Is there a Absolutely. realistic chance of? In I, I think there's no question that that people like Jeff Flake, who feel feel that he has destroyed the the core values of the Republican Party, will in fact feel obligated to run. That, that's not going to be enough. I mean, is that, that a suicide that, no, mission? Not yes, at the moment, now. that that's a suicide mission. Does Donald Trump know your social security number? <laughs> <laughs> you are so audited, dude. Don't tell him. <laughs> <laughs> this is on video. I, this is why I'm No, the video's <laughs> you. Do you now understand why I'm sitting over here? <laughs> I don't want to be anywhere six. near him. <laughs> <laughs> but it'll happen. Challenges, airing of debate, airing of critique, but a serious chance of replacing Donald Trump as the candidate? Well, that comes back to my issue with the base. We're getting vote. a zero from Frank, if you can't see it at the back. Perhaps. No, zero percent. And to Frank's point, I mean, he is so beloved I'm by not surprised you're all so the GOP base. About this. And you have people like John Kasich, people like Jeff Flake, some of these moderates who don't like to see the direction that their party has gone. But they have no chance of taking him on. I mean, so he, he, he defeated Hillary Clinton um, with a shoestring campaign, if you will. Um, now he controls the White House, he controls the Senate. Um, he's raising a ton of money for the Repu Republican National Committee. I mean, he is going into this with a much stronger benefit, especially in a primary, than he did in 2016. I'm, I, I want to ask more about President Trump's... President Trump and the House of Representatives in the next year or so, the, the landscape that's going to inform the 2020 election. Um, I just want to check to see whether anybody has uh, any thoughts, comments now before we... Can we bring a microphone up to the front, the front so two rows, and just gather a series of um, comments, questions so, so as well? briefly before this happens, uh, on, on improving the tax code for $100, no. <laughs> Sorry, I forgot one. I forgot one. I'll, I'll make sure I take Sorry. notes again. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, <clears throat> I'm Seema Shah. I attended your session at Milk and Global earlier this year when you... I wouldn't say moderated the session because there was no cooperation but with, between McCarthy and Schumer when they refused to sit together. Do you feel like the level of cooperation has improved or, and do you think that would repeat itself again next year? That was the single biggest disappointment of my entire relationship with the Milken Conference. Kevin wanted to sit with Chuck Schumer. Chuck Schumer, I don't mind saying this on camera, Chuck Schumer did not want to be interviewed. He thought that if I went too easy on him, it would look like I sold out. If I was too tough on him, it was he who did not want to do it. We have to sit together. We have to talk together. We have to disagree and then walk off shaking hands 
and having a cup of coffee together because that's what sets the tone for everything else. Even on the Democratic side, with Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders, they didn't like each other, but they still cooperated. They still talked to each other, although I will point out that Bernie Sanders is so old, the only time he doesn't have to pee is when he's peeing. <laughs> Right, thank well, you that, for that. That's on video. Thank you. Uh, right, one microphone up here, and I think we've got another one that can go middle. Oh, did you just get passed over? Make sure you're next. He's that's a millennial. All right. He always gets passed over. <laughs> we'll bring you in next. Tell us your name. Uh, Rachel White, and just to piggyback off of your query, do you see any solutions for civility? Do you see leaders or figureheads who are bringing? the dialogue back into a, a civil direction. Uh, can I hold that, hold that thought? Uh, we'll bring the microphone forward. I, I, I have names for you. We will, have, we will have names. We're going to let you leave with some hope, I think. Just very your, your name, sir. Ephraim, um, you mentioned books, and then you also talked about China and how the world is very much changing. What would you recommend for millennials to read? Because at one hand, we've got the economic world and getting employed and we have to learn coding, and we have to look at machine learning and mathematics. And on the other hand, we want to stay human, and we want to learn history. We want to learn geography, understand the mistakes of the past, to not repeat them in the future. And yet we only have 24 hours in the day, and we have social media, and we have all of these stuff. What would you actually recommend, all of you, I know his answer, what would you all recommend? But, right, we're going to, to we're going to give you some time to think about that, and maybe think, uh, finish on this. I can see, yeah, a couple more hands. I think we've got... I'll, I'll take, oh, so, and then two more behind, so we'll take those three. Yeah. Funda Ahan, um, I just wondered if anybody had any comments on the, uh, the Robert Mueller investigation, um, which seems to be, uh, by all accounts, coming to a conclusion. What impact that could deliver um, on the presidency and what the Democrats could do or would do or should do, and indeed the Republicans as well, um, given that the scenarios don't look very optimistic for the, for the White House. Thank you. We're going to have plenty to keep us going right to the end. Um, there were two more hands back there, and I think I'm going to get our answers through then. Is that your name, sir? Uh, Özgür Önder. Um, I'd like to hear the panel's views on the military and defense spending of the United States. It's the largest part of the federal budget. None of you have said a word about it. Nobody ever says a word about That's it, actually. Right. And military and defense spending. Military and defense spending in, uh, of the country. If the United States is so concerned about reining in its deficits and controlling its budget spending and the outlook and tax policy is so important, why not actually think at all about the largest part of the day, federal budget? Ashley, did your neighbor want to say something? Saw your hand. No, I, I was going to just interject that one thing since you were looking for some place to end on hope. Um, is that one place, <laughs> since you were talking about education, infrastructure, uh, where that works is at the state and local level. And while Congress is the mess you've described, I would just interject and you can comment, um, the real laboratory for American democracy is at states and cities. We've devolved into basically a nation of city-states. I'm glad you oh. shot your hand up. Thank and by you. the way, That's that is good. Ron Kirk, uh, former, yeah, former cabinet member. Yes. <laughs> there you go. Thank you. <laughs> uh, it's uh, Tony Fratto. Uh, just a very quick, to Frank's point, all of us in D.C., we say, um, yeah, we need to get back together. You know, like we used to be able to get in a room and work out problems together. They need to be able to sit together and get, you know, these uh, bipartisan, at least understanding agreement on the fact solutions. There are whole segments of both parties who say, actually, that's the problem, is they're all the same, they all get together, they all work, you know, work out things together in Washington, don't understand what we are, what, they think we are all at cocktail parties sorting out things together and wiring things for them. And, and so th there's some dispute on that. The, the, the uh, second point is, uh, I don't think anybody mentioned Beto O'Rourke on the 2020 uh, question, is that a real thing? Right. Okay. No, that's interesting, isn't it? Beto O'Rourke, um, the the Texas star who didn't quite push out Ted Cruz there, um, didn't come up as. The, I'm going to allow this. Uh, if you bring the mic back to the front row, do you still want to ask a question or just have a quick comment? And then, no. then I only have six minutes. Ryan, I'm I'm just curious. Given all the negativity and or pessimism, has that changed the flow of capital into or out out of the U.S.? Ooh. 
Um, I don't know the answer to that. Do any of us know the answer on a capital flow? The, I'm looking at Steve the, in particular. The US, but we may the US is still the most popular destination yes. for capital placement, and that I, I don't think that's going to change. And did um, the tax bill change FDI into the US? We have five minutes no. left. So what I'm going there is there's obviously a, a lot there. We haven't. Uh, I want to I want to finish with a thought on either. A, a book recommendation or, or a solution for civility or, or somebody that you'd recommend as a figurehead or somebody to kind of hang your hopes on. So that's a final thought. Does anybody briefly want to, to come in on Robert Muller? Because you're right, uh, we didn't. I didn't mention Robert Muller, although I'm told that even if there's a partial government shutdown, his investigation funding rolls on. But that, that's perhaps a sign that, that nothing seismic is expected from any of our Yeah, I, I can comment on that really quickly. I mean, look, I, I, I agree um, that the Mueller investigation, it appears that it's coming to an end. Um, I don't think that the American people, unfortunately, care that much about it anymore. It was not an issue that really drove the midterm elections. Um, I do think it's important to getting to the bottom of this for, this for the sake of our democracy and truly understanding if there was Russian collusion. Um, and I think, again, this is where the oversight function of Congress will come in. Um, but ultimately, I think that nothing conclusive will, I mean, I think that he will come, you know, t to the table with some answers, but I don't think anything really <coughs> conclusive will come from it. I'm going to move on to solutions for civility. Well, or, there you go I, on. I, I just wanted to make a comment on the education question, and, and I'm sure Frank has a view there too. I, you know, I don't believe that, you know, there should be no quality of life. I don't believe that young people shouldn't be well-rounded. I'm a big supporter of liberal, liberal arts education. I'm very involved with a liberal arts institution in the US. Um, I, I just believe that other countries are investing more in education than the US is. And if I, you know, if I just anecdotally look at work we are doing you know, across the ASEAN Peninsula, in China, um, in Australia, just all across the Eastern world, it's really outpacing what is happening in the U.S. and the amount of administration, you know, dollars spent on administration and education in the U.S., um, you know, needs a fresh look. So, I, you know, my view is there's, there's just a lot of improvements. Some of it's variability by state and city, as is pointed out, with infrastructure and other things. But, Frank, you probably have a... Uh, do me a favor. Stand up for one second. Darius. So this guy is Darius Baxter. He's here as my guest here. We're actually doing some speeches for the U.S. Embassy. Please talk to him about education. He's done more work through a company, through a, a, an effort called Good Projects. You can sit down because you're tall and they can't see around you. <laughs> uh, and ask him what the schools are like in Washington, D.C. Ask him what the schools are like in, in New York City. Get the personal perspective and he will tell you what is happening to those children. And I'm glad that Britain doesn't have the same challenge we have, but I'll tell you something. The American dream is not alive if you cannot read. The American dream is not alive if you cannot add and subtract. And we are producing hundreds of thousands of kids, not a thousand, who cannot do either and they still get high school degrees. Can I answer the question about the candidates? And they're Democrats. I'll give you three of them. Mitch Landrieu, the former senator of New Orleans. He is the best. And write them down because I want you to Google these guys tonight and read or see what they've done or YouTube them. Mitch Landrieu, brilliant. Michael Bennett, who I hope runs, he's the senator from Colorado and former education commissioner for the state, mm -hmm. and John Hickenlooper, who's the governor of, Co uh, of Colorado and had a great working relationship with the Republicans. Mm -hmm. On the Republican side, I'll mention two people. One is Ben Sass, who is to the right of, but, but also an incredible economist, understands policy, and Tim Scott, the senator from South Carolina, who has more decency in his little finger than most people have in their entire bodies. Those are five politicians. All five of them could bring this country together if they move forward. And I'm just going to add to say that if any of you do want to hear more from Frank and Darius, I'll be interviewing both of them tonight at the British Library at 7.30. So there'll be much more chance to hear if your appetite is not um, sated. Um, so moving on to kind of final thoughts, Sarah, about... Uh, I'm I don't know if there's anything book, uplifting I'm gonna or just give what a should be looking at. book suggestion, and that is anything about AI in particular. <laughs> Which yeah, obviously means guy? that a whole well, debate can change. Yeah, well, just because I think it's something that um, a lot of people don't understand and is going to have a tremendous impact on jobs and the workforce. Yeah. Plus and minus. Yes. Yeah. yeah, education and AI and future-looking. Uh, Adrian? 
So I'm going to go a little off topic and just talk about a book that has nothing to do with the economy but is really inspiring, which is Michelle Obama's new book. Um, I just finished well, you it did. last night. Um, I didn't go last night, no, but I. Um, it's just a, an ex incredibly inspiring book, and I think we could all use a little inspiration right now. Doug? Reasons for hope. Um, I've worked for two great men. Uh, John McCain taught me to look outward and to ask yourself every day if you've done enough to promote democracy and freedom around the globe. Uh, the answer was usually no, but it's, it's something I think about. I worked for George H.W. Bush, uh, who taught me the value of dignity in institutions and politics. And both of them shared an experience defending this country and, and in the armed forces. Um, one of the little noted features of the midterm elections is the election of so many veterans to the House of Representatives. Yep. Yeah. I believe that's, that's oh, a, a moment of hope of people who have that experience and whose party will be less important than promoting uh, this country and its values around the globe. And, and that's my hope. Thank you all. Can Thank I, you for your I questions as well. Once, I'm going to say that I was just about to bring you in on time, but I can't resist another interjection <laughs> from Frank Luntz. Write this down, because I'm, I'm leaving right after this. For those of you who have kids, if you want to ensure that your kids are happy, healthy, drug-free, and alcohol-free, number one, I don't care how successful you are, you have to have dinner with them five nights a week or more, because if you don't, then they will think that there's something in your life that's more important than that child. Number two, you have to check their homework four nights a week or more because that's the intellectual development of the child. These are all in order. Number three is that you have to take a vacation with them of at least one week and you leave the cell phones behind. When I watch parents on their cell phones when their kids are tugging at them, it breaks my heart because that child sees technology as being a higher priority. Number four, do they go to church or temple once a week, because if they believe in God, then they believe in something that's even bigger than themselves. This is not an argument for religion. It is a fact that children who go to church are less likely to do drugs, less likely to get drunk. Number five, do you know where they are on Friday and Saturday nights? Because if they will lie to you about that, they will lie to you about anything. And number six, do they participate in a team sport because then they're responsible to others, not just themselves. If we want to if we want reconciliation in society, we have to heal the family. If we want to heal the family, we have to be devoted to our children, and those are the six ways to prove it to our children. And I would Thank say that wow. talking to your children about the meaning of life is a given, and I've never, I've done this panel, I think it's the fifth time, and I don't think I've ever ended on such a kind of uplifting, lofty note. Thank you all very much. <laughs>